Good evening everyone and welcome to another episode of The Dog Walk, the almost daily uncut, unedited, one-take show where I take my pooches out for a walk and discuss whatever's been on my mind for that day. I think you'll notice that today I was wondering why it was so bright. So I'm in point six zoom like yesterday. I think for today we'll be able to see uh, the video much more clearly than yesterday. Uh, and that's because we've got a nice snowstorm and there's probably a nice full moon hiding behind it. So beautiful weather. Unfortunately, Daisy saw that the snow is higher than she is tall and she decided not to join us. So it's just Mistra and me today. A uh, little point of admin, I do tend to ramble on a little bit, so feel free to skip ahead. I will put timestamps down in the description below if you don't want to hear me speak a little bit about myself or you want to skip straight to the main topic of today's video. But otherwise, thanks for your attention. One key thing that I wanted to mention or discuss is my my not wanting to limit myself in the topics that I discuss. And I realize that this means that most people are likely not want to follow this channel because I talk about so many different things that may not initially strike your interest. But to me, that's something that's important. I've mentioned in previous videos why I think that we need, as I had mentioned there, uh, less generals and more generalists. So I think it's a key point that everyone needs a little bit more of open-mindedness. And that starts by being willing to listen to things that you may not have thought you would be interested in. I've realized myself many times in the past that few things that I thought at first I may not like, whether it's food or music or even gaming, sports, activities, don't knock it till you try it. You might actually find out that you enjoy it. I remember just to give a few examples, I, I'm a metalhead, punk, and classical, all my favorite kinds of genres. Forever, I would not listen to a single rap song. Rap was the enemy of punk back when I was in high school, and, uh, and or country, or anything like that. But as I grew up, I matured a little bit, and although you won't see me actively seeking rap, hip-hop, or country on a regular basis, I don't mind it. And I also think that it's important that I raise my son with this open mind, so even though I'm not a country fan or a hip-hop fan, I do actually make him listen to that music. Uh, my son turned six months old two days ago. Sorry, not two... Well, it might be two days ago. It might be past midnight right now. Anyway, on the 13th. So, um, every day, although the main music that I make him listen to is classical, followed by metal, because metal is my number one favorite type of music, I truly believe that if classical composers were born, born today and made new music, a lot of them would be making metal. And I know that I'm not the only person to think that. There is something to it. I like complexity. But anyway, despite that, even if my son is just six months old, my goal is not to make a carbon, carbon copy of myself, regardless of how awesome or not I might think that I am. Um, my goal is to make someone or well, someone, to make my son better than I am. And that includes exposing him to stuff that I may not like or that I may not agree. Mistra, <laughs> what's under there? So yeah, 
Uh, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, other examples I remember uh, when I was in high school, I despised people who played EverQuest because I thought MMOs were beneath a real gamer who plays RTSs, right? And fast forward a few years later, I try out the World of Warcraft beta. I still remember my undead necromancer that I played in the beta. And uh, WoW ended up consuming the, my life for several years afterwards. I had to quit and still to this day, now 20 years later, my best friends that I mention all the time, Yan and JF, or Alex who passed away I mentioned a few videos ago, those are all people not from my university. They're people that I met through WoW who were in my guild back in the Burning Crusade. So anyway, uh, keep an open mind, I guess, is the point that I'll put here. But that's not the act. So yeah, keep an open mind so that we create more generalists who can link different topics and see the bigger picture as opposed to focusing down into a narrow mindset like everyone seems to be doing nowadays. That being said, since I'm sort of revisiting a little bit the uh, generalist versus generals idea, I thought that I would today revisit actually the first real topic that I covered in the Doc Walk all the way back in episode 2. Oh, it might have been the second one that I covered in episode 3. Anyway. Uh, moral relativism. At the time, I had stated that I didn't really remember or understand why philosophers consider it as a dead or untenable position. And since then, I happened to randomly come across a video that stated at least a part of that answer. So I want to answer that today. In that video, they said that the reason why philosophers think uh, that moral relativism is not a tenable or logically consistent position is that moral relativism has the, the statement that you, know, you should let others have whatever mentality or moral compass or attitude that they want and therefore that itself is an absolute position, right? Saying that you should let others be is an absolute statement. And at the surface, I think, you know, I agree that, that, that that's a valid point. But I think they're, they're kind of losing the forest for the trees when they say that. Um, they are using or argumenting against moral relativism from an absolutist position. They are the ones who are stating that a moral relativist must accept all other points of view. Therefore, everyone must accept all points of view. Therefore, that's absolute and that's inconsistent. Well, that's not quite how I see it. I see it in relative terms. In my mind, how do I put this? Yeah, I'll try to put it in the simplest way possible. It is that it's not because I believe that every moral position should be examined or can have value, that I also believe that everyone must agree with me. So, what I'm trying to say is that it's not because I say you should let others live or you shouldn't impose your morals on someone else that I also think that everyone must agree with me for that specific point. That's taking an absolutist position on, again, a relativistic point of view. So actually, I believe that to be a true moral relativist, you must be able to accept the fact that there can be a society or a person or you know any other type of entity that does not believe 
that every point of view has value and you know the, the moral relativist position and holds an absolutist position i never said that they're not allowed to do that i think that to be a true moral relativist you must accept that so if you're talking about let's say you know a repressive old school regime like sharia law or anything like that just to take one example i'm not trying to pick on a specific point of view quite the opposite i think that they are allowed to do that and that unless we let them quote unquote carry out that ex experiment and live how they think is best to live we'll never know if they're right or wrong and I'll refer to my first video, I believe I had mentioned sort of moral or societal Darwinism as the main cause of why we all hold our current moral points of view. And that if anything had gone different, you know, if, if Rome hadn't fallen to the barbarians, or if China hadn't lost the war against the european powers or hadn't closed itself off and fallen behind blah 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 you know if the world if random dude if if descartes had never been born or had an accident right uh our moral positions in the world today may be completely different and we have no way of knowing whether today's world and today's moral positions are in fact better it's just like in yesterday's video where I was uh, talking about chance and evolution and all of that, answering uh, Dr. DeGrasse Tyson's point about whether we are special or not. Um, yeah, it's chance. So we could be living... The world we currently live in is not the only possible one. The moral construct that we live in is not the possible one the only possible one and therefore we don't know that it's necessarily the best one and things may have evolved completely differently so we should be giving a chance to these more i'll say authoritarian rather than repressive points of view to state their case run their experiment live how they want to live let's go this way today mister this way let's go straight yeah so that's the 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 i guess the summary of my counterpoint is that these people are taking a an absolutist argument or assigning an absolutist position to a relative one by saying that as a moral relativist you must you know let everyone live how they and their how they want and therefore that is a an absolute position and it's logically inconsistent no that's not the case you can as a moral relativist be fine with an absolutist position even though you don't agree with it you can find value in in that position and that's what I think people are missing when they say moral relativism doesn't make sense. Hopefully that argument is not too foreign or hey, it might already have been debunked. And uh, if so, I'd really like to hear it, how and why, you know, what was said. Um, but yeah, that's the first point that I that I wanted to make and don't get me wrong I'm not saying that you know no morals matter in this and that I still think that my position has value otherwise I wouldn't hold it right so I do think that it would be good for me or from my point of view to convince others to you know move a little bit towards my way of seeing things i do think that it's okay for me to try to you know change people's minds and all that stuff but that doesn't mean yeah uh, i think I'm, I'm talking in circles around my point hopefully you understand uh where, what i'm 
trying to get with that so i'm not trying to say that oh nothing matters everything can be can be true therefore uh you know take a sort of almost a, a schopenhauer-esque position uh, of uh of pessimism or even a nihilistic position even worse right uh, of nothing matters because everything could be true no i still think it's valuable to try to bring people to your side but i also think that it's very important to recognize that other positions that disagree with you may have value and to live uh, with that in mind right the other thing i wanted to say related to that and what that leads me to is or to further support my argument i should say think about yourself when you were six years old when you were 16 years old when you were 26 years old if you've reached that far did your moral compass did your priorities did your way of seeing the world align throughout your entire life was everything that was important to you when you were six years old was it still as important to you when you were 26 do you not evolve learn stuff change adapt is that not what life is right so even at the personal level but even more importantly at the societal level but even at the personal level i think it's important to recognize that life is not static therefore to go about with absolutes i think is very misguided because other than the laws of mathematics and physics and i would argue that even physics possibly not everything is absolute uh, i have a little theory about uh, planck length and planck's constant you know what if it's not a constant anyway i'm not going to go into that one I think there's a random person there just watching me. That's sort of weird. But anyway, uh, and now I've lost my train of thought. But uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's very important to recognize that in life, things change and you need to evolve and adapt. And that is true whether Mistra, you're at the individual level or at the, the societal level. Right? Um, the world whether you're talking about you know famine personal situation war technology things change and if you fail to also adapt your philosophical or your moral code as a result of that or as a consequence of that uh what really is the value of your position let's go doesn't matter it's a person they're allowed to exist let's go Come on, right? So, so I think that trying to just find the absolute is not recognizing the changing nature of life and the universe. And that is very short-sighted and misguided. Uh, if you fail to adapt and evolve, you stop, come on. They're like a million kilometers the other way. Let's go. There's no one there anymore. Okay, let's go. Right? If you fail to adapt and evolve, you die. That's life. So why is that true for everything but not our morals or our philosophy? I don't know. Maybe there's a philosopher who has a good answer for that. I sure don't, but I'd be really happy to hear it if you know it. So yeah, learn to adapt. Learn to evolve. If your moral code doesn't follow reality, I don't think it's a good moral code. So that was sort of the, the second or the conclusion that, that results from being a little bit more open-minded to different philosophical points of view, different moralities. But again, hey, maybe I'm wrong. And if I am, I would sure love for that one static society when it's, it's one moral code, it's one Bible set of rules that never changes, in big quotes, to prove me wrong. Because, hey, 
I don't claim to have the absolute, you know, I'm not omniscient, I'm not omnipotent, I don't know everything. I don't know human is. So let's act in consequence and realize that, hey, uh, let's, let's give others a chance to prove us wrong. And there might be a moral code that will stand the test of time. But unless we, you know, unless we are open to it, we'll never find it. If we're always only trying to impose our morality on others because we think we have the truth with a capital T and they are just misguided, well, for all the reasons I've stated before, whether it's the pure luck of you know evolution of morals or this or that, um, you know, uh, we might be in for a, a rough ride and we might just miss the actual truth with a capital T if it exists it might exist I don't know that's my entire point so I don't think there's an absolute uh, or sorry an absolute yeah an absolute requirement for a moral relativist to not accept a non-moral relativist point of view anyway I hope that makes sense since I have a little bit more time and it's so beautiful out, I guess I'll talk about another related topic that, uh, that, that touches on moral relativism, which, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I have a little frog in my throat here, just, uh, and I don't want to cut, ah, what do we do? <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. So. You fail, fail to evolve, uh, you fail to adapt, you, you, you'll die out. That's what evolution teaches us. Unless you are the one dominant force, right? Like humans are right now. Um, the next point that I wanted to bring is the complexity of the code. So what I mean by that is I think that we sort of need, whoa, that was deeper than expected. And how do I, how do I, yeah, how do I say that? Is that a person there? No, that's just a tree. My eyes are playing tricks on me. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, let's say it this way. Pardon for all the, the hesitations there. I think that, just like scientists need engineers to translate their theories into practical applications that are useful for humans, because let's be honest, um, relativity is great, quantum theory is awesome, mathematics are the language of God, of the universe, whatever you want this, however you want to say it. But they themselves don't make satellites fly or computers work or, you know, the economy run. What actually makes it useful is the engineer who takes this nebulous principle and finds a, a concrete application for it. Well, I think that the same thing is true for philosophy. We need philosophical engineers. I don't know what they would be called, like practical philosophers. And in fact, at the beginning, there's a reason why when someone studies science or, or engineering, uh, you know, when someone gets a PhD, it's called a, like it's a PhD because it's a philosophical doctorate, right? Because at the beginning, science was just called natural philosophy. I think we need to, now that science has sort of separated itself into its own category, we need to go back to the drawing board and revive the idea of the, the applied philosopher. 
and I don't maybe part of that is sort of covered by self-help gurus and this and that but I think that most of those or many of those are more out for let's say a quick buck or to pass on a specific agenda rather than to truly popular not popularize that's not the right word but truly bring philosophical concept to the masses to the everyday person the reason why I think that is to continue the analogy with science quantum mechanics or string theory or whatever you want to say um, is great at explaining the world but it's so complex there, there was this famous quote I think it was from Niels Bohr uh, who basically was goes something along the lines of there, there, there's only three people in the entire world who actually understand quantum mechanics and and two of them are sitting in this room type thing at the time um, if a theory if an I said theory because I was thinking of science but I'll say if a philosophical argument or position or body of work is so complex that it can't be understood by normal people or by people I'm not in general is it really useful you may be able to after hundreds of years of work uh, of multiple philosophers come up and create the the um, you know the, the one true philosophy the 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 one equal not equation but the one philosophical theory at the the philosophical absolute position that will describe morally everything that anyone should do in all circumstances right sort of like the the grand unified theory that einstein was after the one equation that will explain everything in the universe right you may be able to reach that. I highly doubt it because of what I said before. Uh, if you stop evolving, you die. But if that code, that morality is so complex that no one can understand it except for three people in the world, two of which are in this room, then what what did you do what did you accomplish all right where, where how how is that useful i don't think that it is i think that you need to have a middleman somewhere who takes these grand principles and finds a way to apply them concretely in a very very much more basic way than even current you know uh, self-help guru or gurus or, or communicators share there needs to be an intermediate step between the mathematical equation there and the phone that you hold in your hand right there, there needs to be the engineer that concretely takes that and creates something now don't get me wrong i don't know what that something is or what it would look like it would be great if some philosophers looked at the question and kind of framed it out but yeah i think there needs to be a middleman between the philosopher and the general public just like right now the Howard, to use an older reference, that the Howard is the middleman between the Sheldon and the students or the, the audience, right? There needs to be that engineers that takes the principle and turns it into something that's applied.
because otherwise you'll create your grand unified theory of philosophy and morality that is absolute and that applies to everything and everyone in all circumstances but it's going to be so complex that it's going to be useless no one's going to be able to use it no one's going to be able to apply it yeah so that was kind of the 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 second or i guess third point that i wanted to discuss when it comes to philosophy or moral relativism and going a little bit deeper than that it's that that's another argument in my mind that comes from relativism almost insofar as if it's well Misra, what do you see okay i guess it was nothing um yeah there, ne there needs to be that bridge in the gap between the the ether of the deepest thoughts of the most brilliant philosophers ever who will create that grand unified absolute theory if it actually exists and the people who are expected to apply it because it sure is not realistic to expect every single human being or even most or even many human beings to be able to truly grasp the meaning behind the words or the, the writings of the smartest philosophers in history. When you think about it, that, that's completely not realistic to, to think. Yeah, so that's kind of my position on that. I'm not sure, again, what it would look like. Hey, maybe it's an AI that can interpret these philosophers and, and provide you, you know, what's the correct course of action. Because I'm not sure a human would be able to, to do that. But maybe they can. I just haven't thought of how. And I don't want to try to imply that I think that there should be no free will and we should just let AI make all our decisions in our lives for us but it's not realistic just like it's not realistic to expect everyone to understand quantum mechanics and string theory and every other deep science you know, neural nets and that type of stuff it's not realistic to expect people to understand the most complex philosophies that the smartest brains have ever thought of in the history of mankind so let's act like it let's create the middleman let's create the philosophical engineer what do you think does any of this make sense hopefully it does again if you've got an argument or another argument against moral relativism i'd be uh, happy to hear it please let me know down in the comments otherwise if you agree or disagree or have something I haven't thought of, please let me know. Thanks again for listening to this other episode of The Dog Walk, and have a great evening.